I don't know what he needs me for. So validate what I'm going to tell him you were right. Take Some five dollar Tuesdays for you to fill it up. <laughs> oh, it's Wednesday. I'm sorry. Wednesday. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm excited that we're going to have a compelling conversation with two incredibly important members of, of our community. Uh, let's just set a couple of ground rules before we start. My name is Elmer Moore. I'm the Executive Director of Scale Up Milwaukee, an initiative of the Greater Milwaukee Committee. If you don't know about Scale Up, the one thing I want you to know is we are focused on growth. So you're going to hear that as a consistent theme in today's conversation. Uh, please, please, I invite you to silence your cell phones now. Um, I know that you think you already did it, but why don't you give it one more check? So uh, I used to have a rule that if someone's cell phone rang and I could hear it, then I got to answer it in front of the whole class. And I think we want to avoid that. Now that we have essentially cut off communication with the outside world, I want to now invite you to be very communicative externally. Uh, Skeleton Milwaukee has <coughs> Twitter, it has Facebook, our Twitter handle is at scaleup underscore MKE, our Facebook is scaleup MKE. Uh, we invite you to talk about what you're seeing, what you're hearing. Uh, we want to make growth and growth in the Milwaukee area, a conversation that is loud. We want to celebrate what's happening. We want to celebrate those who have come before us who have really been masters of growth. And we want to tell the story about what's happening. Thirdly, while this is staged like an interview, I'm actually a facilitator of a conversation. And so at any point, please raise your hands or just indicate that you have a question I'm happy to start with audience questions from the very beginning of the conversation. We're going to really have uh, a couple of themes. One is going to be growth. The other is going to be secession, as we do have uh, a second and third generation uh, uh, pair on the stage. And finally, we're going to talk about community, because uh, they have proven it very, very community-oriented and philanthropic in their work. So. I'm proud to present uh, Mr. Stephen Marcus and Mr. Gregory Marcus from the Marcus Corporation. Please welcome them with our applause. So, good morning. Morning. How are we feeling this morning? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a coffee cup away from feeling really good. Oh, good, <laughs> good, okay, so drink quickly. So just for the sake of clarity, let's identify, um, Steve is to your left, this is Steve Marcus, uh, he is the son of the founder of Marcus Corporation, <coughs> Ben Marcus. Um, instead of me giving the history, why don't we invite you to give the history, as you, as you like to say it, of Marcus Corporation and your work there. <laughs> How long do we have? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> the Cliff Notes Ooh. version. <laughs> um, okay. Well, the, the company was founded by my father, Ben Marcus, in 1935, which coincidentally was the year that I was born. And I was born hungry, and so he figured he had to have, be able to feed me. And um, 
he was, uh, we all lived in Minneapolis, which is where I was born, and uh, he was uh, working for a newspaper there, uh, selling advertising to movie theater operators. And uh, he was not only selling them the advertising, he was writing all their ads, he was doing all the work for them. And uh, he finally decided that was, that was a, they were making a lot of money, and he figured that's a business he ought to be in. And so he and a cousin of his looked around for a location to build a theater, to own a theater. And he was looking for a place that didn't have one. And uh, his cousin lived in uh, Nielsville, Wisconsin. And uh, so they drove around and drove around. And finally, they found Ripon, Wisconsin had no movie theater. Also didn't have much of a population either. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but they, but they, uh, they found an old building, it was an old department store that had been burned out, uh, and they built a movie theater there. It was the Campus Theater, uh, became the Campus Theater, and uh, they renovated it, and, and a lovely little theater, and it did very well. And as it happens, that is our company shrine. We still own it today. Doesn't make any money. Anybody like a theater, <laughs> it's available. <laughs> They made money until you redid the marquee. <laughs> <laughs> no, <that's good. laughs> um, and so that's where it all started. And uh, he was, uh, he and, and my mother, really, uh, spent a lot of time running that theater. It was a typical entrepreneurial operation. And they opened it up, they ran it, they, they sold the vending, they, he booked the pictures, uh, they, they, they cleaned up the place, they did everything. And uh, it turned out to be very successful. The customers responded. And uh, he, got, um, uh, he got anxious because he was ambitious. And uh, it was doing well. And he figured, you know, I ought to look for another one. And he went to Toma, Wisconsin and did another one. And then after that, one followed the other. Yes. And uh, finally, at some point, they had something like 15 or 20 theaters all located in Wisconsin and a couple over in Iowa. And um, so, so Steve, I, I want to interrupt you. There, there's yeah. something you said. He was an entrepreneurial guy. You sort of undersold that. I mean, he is the prototypical oh, I mean, entrepreneur. I mean, absolutely. The immigrant family, uh, you know, something from nothing. This is a guy who had a paper route, <clears throat> who was so assertive about selling papers that he, he hired other people to sell those papers and he bought a car so that he could deliver the papers. Yeah. Uh, so when we hear he worked for the newspaper, I mean, this is an entrepreneur. So what I would love to hear is, you all have been, the two of you have been pretty entrepreneurial in your own right. What's your entrepreneur story? What's your version of the paper route? Ooh. <laughs> well, my version was a little different because I wound up uh, going through college and got an accounting degree and then I got a law degree. And so that, that gives you a little different start, but uh, of course when I came to work for, uh, after uh, another job uh, doing real estate development, came to work with my father, um, we wound up in a business that was uh, developing discount department stores. Now today they're known as Walmart and Target, and so on, but that's, that's not where it started out. It started out with a company called Treasure Island and um, they, they, they bought an interest in it, and because it was a, essentially a real estate play, uh, he said, you know, why don't you come back here from San Francisco, which is where I was working, and, uh, and help us develop this thing. And we got it started, and moving along, and uh, one day J.C. Penney came along and said, we would like to buy your, your uh, discount department store chain, and uh, we happen to have a very large distribution center, which is really what they wanted, because mm -hmm. they just they had a lot of stores around, and uh, they wanted the distribution center, but they also wanted the discount department stores. They figured that's going to be their future. Well, when they did that, I thought to myself, I don't want to be working for a big company like J.C. Penney. I really want to do, I wanna, I'd like to work with my father. And, uh, and he was anxious to have me come along, and, uh, uh, and his legal records were a mess. Typical <laughs> entrepreneur. Walk into the vault, there were, about, at that point, about 50 minute books. Wow. Never opened up one of them. <laughs> they never had any minutes of any of the companies they had created. I mean, they were all operating companies. They never held an annual meeting. They never held a, they had any meetings. And so it was a mess. 
So there I was, all these books on my desk, and one day he walks in and says, you know, we got a chance to buy uh, the, the second mortgage on the Fister Hotel. <laughs> I said, what's the Fister Hotel? Because I was just new to t back so, to town so at that point. So the year is 1962. 62, great. Right. Okay, so we've got uh, <laughs> Ben Marcus started the company in 1935. He's 24 years old, <clears throat> just to get the facts. Things are going really well. It's 1962. Ben, the elder, 51 years old, business is great. Steve, the younger, uh, is 27. He's got a BBA, he's got a, a bachelor's in accounting, he's got the, uh, the JD. So now he gets invited into the Marcus Corporation business. He comes on as, uh, what was your first job title? Oh gosh, I don't, I don't even remember. Yeah. I'm not sure we had titles in those days. I was, I was, I, my title was, I'm the son. He was the son. <laughs> <laughs> he was the son. So, so you, you, you get an opportunity, you know, the Fister comes up for auction. Yep. He makes this crazy decision to buy this derelict property and, and take it from there. That was the right word, derelict. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it was, it was a mess. But all of downtown Milwaukee was a mess. And, uh, but he, we had movie theaters downtown, and, uh, and he, was, he felt it was important. Now, I can tell you this. He's, you know, if you own the most important hotel in town, it makes you a big guy. You're a big man. It's a very really interesting insight into his own personality um, and his own uh, sense of inadequacies, if you will. And, uh, uh, and, but he felt if he really did a number on it, did something good for the downtown. I promise you, uh, my comment there was that in the middle of summer, if you shot off a cannon in the downtown, nobody would hear it. The town was that dead, that quiet in the downtown area. It was awful. And uh, so we, anyway, we, we, we picked up the second mortgage. We wound up owning the hotel. The foreclosure uh, was sort of a formality because we were, in fact, the owner. And I'll never forget, the, uh, he said, well, this thing is in, in bankruptcy. Uh, why don't you go down, just kind of watch the hotel, because he had been named the referee in bankruptcy. And uh, so I went downtown. I commandeered a desk in an office. And the uh, first morning there, I knock on the door. I oh, come in. And there's a young lady standing at the door. I said, can I help you? She said, yes. She said, what rooms am I supposed to clean today? I said, well, wait a minute, don't you have a housekeeper? Well, we did, but she quit this morning. And I thought to myself, welcome to the hotel business. <laughs> and, uh, and that's where it all got started. Now, the original idea was to build the tower, build that addition, renovate the old building, but build that tower. And we went about doing that. And uh, from there, and, and at the same time, we were, um, I mean, he was, he was amazing. He was an amazing character. At the, at, at the same time that we were building that tower, uh, they had just gotten started in the restaurant business with the Big Boy, Mark's Big Boy restaurants. Most of you are too young to remember Mark's Big Boy restaurants, but they were, gosh, I don't know what the equivalent might, might have been today. They were, they were like a McDonald's, but full service McDonald's. They were all over the city. Eventually they were all over the state. Uh, in fact, in four states. Um, so, uh, so we were heavily in the restaurant business, growing it very rapidly. Uh, started growing the hotel business. Uh, shortly thereafter, we, uh, uh, th we took over what is now the Radisson Hotel out at Mayfair, across from Mayfair Shopping Center. At the time, it was, it was a Sheraton, and we ran that. And then we uh, bought the, um, uh, the, what was the, called the Sheraton Schrader. Uh, and then we, it became the Mark Plaza, and now it's the Hilton. And we put the addition on that. So it, we kind of went from one thing to the next thing. And then during all of that, uh, we started a thing called Budgetel Inns. That was in a time when uh, there, there was no such thing as limited service lodging. There was nothing like Hampton Inn or Holiday Inn had just gotten started. Uh, and we started building that. And that became a very large part of our company. So it kind of went from one thing to another to, and I don't, I, it was just always very opportunistic. I can tell you this, the common thread running through the whole thing has been small businesses replicated. If you think about everything we do, 
we tend to develop a model for it, and then if it works, we keep replicating it. And when I say if it works, uh, sometimes it's an aesthetic success and a financial failure. You know, you can have that. Uh, we're, we're interested in the financial side of it. We want to make sure that it's financially viable because if it's not, it wreaks all kinds of havoc for your associates, for your employees, and everybody else, and for, the, and for the rest of your company, too, because it becomes a drain. So we always wanted to make sure that if it was successful, then we figured we'll try to replicate it. And even a hotel like the Pfister, uh, which is our flagship hotel, is really um, sort of a, um, it, 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 in the scheme of things, it's relatively a small business. And so we try to replicate, we use the same systems, um, even if we have different franchises, whether it's Hilton or Marriott, uh, uh, Will, Will, uh, or, or uh, Intercontinental, uh, the systems are pretty similar. Uh, in the movie theaters, they're virtually identical. Systems are all the same. From so so I, don't, I don't want to get ahead of us. So first of all, I want to say, if you notice, uh, Steve can't help but talk about growth. This is an orientation that is natural. It's in their DNA. So even though I haven't even introduced the subject, he's already talking about how they grew. But we're going to come back to that. So 1962. Can I just interrupt just one thing? Please. Did you, make, you did make a point that, that's an important thing, which is one of the advantages to doing small businesses over and over again is that we're not a bet the ranch kind of company. So when you, when you, because I've at least I'm not batting a thousand, <laughs> and I don't know, you know, when when you make a mistake, it doesn't cripple you, mm -hmm. you know, the conservative financial structure. But on top of that, because we've seen some, we saw one recently, look, where a guy had a great idea, it seemed like, and it worked, you know, but it was a big bet, and he kept making, he made three big bets. The fourth, the fourth big bet actually bet a little bit more. It only did half the volume of the third one, which then it, he, all his equity was gone. Mm. And so by sort of making small bets over and over again, I think that conservative approach was, was important to the success of the company. It, it was very important. And I'll never forget my father always uh, on his desk, he had a, a, a booklet. And in that book, he'd open it up every morning, first thing. It had been put on his desk by his accountant. And what was it? It was his cash balances every morning. Uh, the theaters would always report back in. Every, every business reports in every night, overnight. And the controller would make note of the bank balances wow. every day. That's how carefully he was watching what was going on. And that was his main financial statement, is, is the cash balance continuing to grow. Um, <clears throat> And along with it, though, the most important thing, aside from the model, which was this replicating small businesses, uh, refining them, making them as good as they could be, uh, the most important thing to his growth was the people, the people side of it. And uh, uh, he believed that, I believe that, and uh, in all honesty, uh, when it came time, uh, we, we had our own family development program, and uh, Greg was sent off to go get a degree in accounting and in law. <laughs> and he didn't know we were getting him ready. <laughs> uh, and, um, and I must tell you, I was thrilled when the time came that, uh, uh, that I needed to uh, move over, uh, maybe uh, take a more overarching view of what was going on, that uh, Greg at that time uh, had uh, decided he wanted to come back and, uh, and be a part of our company, um, that, uh, that he had the skills and uh, the, the word that's uh, heavily overused today, but an important word, the temperament, mm -hmm. to run the, uh, the, the, the company, uh, the nature of which uh, was the Marcus Corporation. And uh, I'm thrilled that as he came along and he developed, uh, he had most important thing, won the respect of all of our other senior executives in the company so that he was in a position uh, to take the reins and carry it on for a third generation. Um, so so let's, let's tell Greg's story a little bit. Sure. So 1962, they buy the Pfister. A few years later, Greg is born. 
Uh, <laughs> start. Yeah, it's a great way to enter the world. And I want to tell you, he came to the attention of management at an early age. <laughs> so, so at age 28, yeah, 1992, right. yeah. do the math, uh, Greg joins. He's gone out to California. He's been sorting his oats. Uh, he joins as director of property management and corporate development into a now publicly traded company. So the company went public in 1972. So what you've got is a founder at, at, uh, in 1935. You've got the founder taking the company public. The founder then steps down and acts only as chairman. So he's no longer CEO. Uh, you've got second generation, the son, steps up as president in 1988. CEO, COO in 1989. I'm, I'm telling all your business, he was 53 years old. There's a pattern here. Uh, and then you've got the third generation steps in. 1992, he's 28. He goes, 92, joined as director of property management, corporate development. 99, senior vice president, corporate development. 2005, executive officer, he joins the board. 2008, he's president. 2009, he becomes chief executive officer. 2009, he's now 45. So we've got these major transitions which happen to sync up. Mid to late 20s, late 40s, each of these in the three generations goes from jumping in to jumping up. So, Greg, you joined in 1992. You've also got the same degrees as your father. What are you thinking? Well, I also had a partial film degree at that point. So you, <laughs> that was <laughs> that was a good. That was fun. You know, because I had gotten the county degree and I got the law degree, and I had an offer to go work for a law firm, and then I got into the USC Film School, <laughs> and I can only imagine his because I now have children who might one day call me and say, "Hey, good news! I've got this law degree. I'm going to go to film school." <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to become a perpetual student. I could have been. I, I, I say any, any more degrees, I'd have a temperature. Um, the, uh, the, uh, but I, but I, but I dropped out and I moved back. I moved back to Chicago. But you know, the company was, the company was different though. There were there were some there were similarities and differences, right? Because what my dad had done too was he he. Because we came, as he said, there, there were all these little binders. It was, it was not as well organized. And so he did. And this is, I think, very, um, it's not, it's not it's, it's, I think, if for, for successful multi-generational businesses, I don't think this is unheard of, where the entrepreneur starts, the, 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 the entrepreneur. Because I think there's an entrepreneurial culture in our company that really pervades. So I don't want to say that, he, that my grand, the original entrepreneur comes in and he gets things going. But they may not be ready, you know, to grow and to, and I, and I just was, sort of coming to these thoughts recently on something else, the, the idea about how do you grow at some scale, right? It's about people. And when you came in, you really professionalized and said, we, we need a, professional, a team of professional managers to come in and, and help guide the business. A lawyer, uh, HR, uh, finance, you know, because it was, and, and so that was really started with my dad. And so now when I come into the business, um, a lot of that's, that's, that's in place now. And so the, the business is now in a position to succeed at that next level, and yet still is imbued with this entrepreneurial culture, I think, that, that, that's, that, that's, a, that's a very good thing. But it's different than, than I know. I know my life was different than my grandfather's or my father's coming in. The company was different. The expectations were different. Um, the, uh, but, but the other common theme was, well, at least from, you know, I, the thing you pointed out was so there's 15 years between when I came in mm -hmm. and then when I took more of a, of, a, of, a, of a senior leadership role. I was working my way up, and my dad was very careful about not coming in and, hey, welcome, you're in charge, you know, you're, you're now, you know, the president, I'll, you know, that he didn't, I started off, you know, in, in his, I don't know what that was originally, but if we were over in the 212 building in your old secretary's office, she was, they were secretaries then, they weren't assistants, it was, that was, I'm pretty sure it was a closet at one point. <laughs> And so here I am, I come back now, I'm, I've got notched down, you know, I was, I was a lawyer and I'm like, wait a minute, I am in an office, I'm not kidding, it went from like, you know, I wouldn't say it went from that column to that column, it was pretty small, <laughs> no windows on the inside. So, 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 so tell me this, you all have shown an incredible facility and an ambition to grow, why? Why keep growing? So in, in 1994, 
you've got 340 properties that you own or manage. Uh, your, your balance sheet or you know, the number of properties you own has changed over the years. You're actually in some ways smaller, but you're more profitable, I'm gathering, you are generating more in revenue. Why keep growing? Why increase the complexity? You have only two ways to go, and that one is up and the other one is down. Standing still is not an option. Uh, otherwise, someone's going to grab your cheese, you know? So you, you just have to stay with it and keep, t take advantage of the opportunities. There are times, we found out, when you say, I have to shrink a little bit. And so, at, I mean, all these companies that I outlined earlier, the, uh, the restaurants uh, are gone. Big boy's gone. Oh, and KFC, which we came in, we talk about something entrepreneurial with KFC. We had, the, we had these big boys, and they were essentially full-service fast food restaurants. That's what they were. And, uh, but they had pretty good-sized menus, and we had a chicken on the menu, and it was not a good chicken. And the guy that was running that business for us, he was our partner at the time, said, I've got to find a better chicken. Well, Kentucky Fried Chicken in those days was sold as a menu item in other people's restaurants. That's how Colonel Sanders did it. There were no uh, standalone KFC restaurants. And um, so uh, we, we decided, well, let's put KFC on the menu and the big boys. And that was, that was explosive. I mean, they did a terrific amount of business in the big boy stores. And uh, then one day, uh, the Colonel sold KFC uh, a fellow by the name of John Y. Brown bought it uh, from Nas he's from Nashville, and they said, "No more menu items. We're not going to be a menu item in somebody else's restaurant. You all have to open your own stores if you want to continue to be a franchisee." And we wound up doing that. We we bought, <laughs> and in those days, this was in the early 70s, gas stations were closing up all over the world. And we, must have, we bought 30 gas stations and converted them into KFC stores. Later That's on, we, appetizing. That's later, yeah. <laughs> well, later, on, later on, we found out there was a lot of oil underneath the store. <laughs> yeah, but not the good kind. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> not the, <laughs> very good. <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, over time, we wound up cleaning them up and selling them off, and then we opened new freestanding stores. The, the, the gas station stores were essentially drive-through stores um, with walk-up counters. There was no seating in the, those at that time. I mean, that turned out, that for a big company, they were very entrepreneurial too because they were doing all kinds of things to change this thing around. Mm -hmm. And it was very, wound up to be very successful. And then later on, we bought Applebee's. In the meantime, at some point in time, we decided that that we, needed, we were developing uh, this thing I talked about, Budgetel, earlier, and that was growing very rapidly. That had turned out to be very successful. Uh, they were expensive to build, and we felt that the growth was over in the restaurant business. It was very tough. There was a lot of competition, and that there was more opportunity in the, uh, in the uh, limited service lodging side of things. And so we made a conscious decision to sell out of Big Boy. We were actually a little late, so we didn't do as well as we probably could have if we had sold earlier. And uh, ultimately, we then sold uh, Applebee's, and then after that, KFC. So to give you all some perspective, in 1994, there's roughly 340 properties. Uh, in 2009 and 2011, there was roughly 74 properties. Uh, now, the Marcus Corporation, which is two divisions, uh, is the fifth largest movie theater operation in the country. Uh, and your total number of properties is 18 hotels and resorts. And I, seem it, I, I can only find information on the number of screens. Mm -hmm. So how many properties are there? There's 600 and some change screens. Is that? Yeah, it's about, f I, th I think, what, 55, yeah. 58, 50, 55 complex or something like that. I, mean, I actually don't remember the exact number because the metric for us is screens. It's screens. And so, so there's this very significant change in the number of doors that are operating, uh, which I find interesting. So I, I want to go back to something you touched on. 
So I'm going to read a quote uh, from an article I found. Here, I'm sorry, just going to go back to one yes, thing on the, issue of ch on the issue of growth and the importance of it. Because and, and, you, you, you started talking about one piece of it, which is the idea of that and it, we, we told we were saying change is the only constant. You've got to you've got to grow and and or people or because you can only go one grow or die. But the other thing too is if you want good people to work for you, you have to be in a growing organization because good people want to be a part of something that is growing. They that that is and so and, and to your point, this is and, and you know the, and these are these that we believe people are our most important assets, and especially for businesses like our, it's really any business. I don't care what it is, you know, a construction business. I mean, you, we know that if we have a good job superintendent, the job goes well, and if we have a bad job superintendent, it doesn't go well. It's, it's that simple. Um, if you want good people to be associated with you, they have to feel like they're part of something that's growing. If you're stagnant, they probably, you'll probably start losing people, I think, don't so, you think? So that's, that's exactly where we're heading. There's this theme, which is talent. You know, the, the quote from, from Ben was, uh, you know, when asked what his most valuable asset was, he said, my people. And, the, and this, you know, analyst says, no, no, I mean, I'm, you know, value, we're talking about theaters or hotels. What's, what's actually your most valuable asset? And he said, uh, again, my people, I can always borrow money or build a beautiful building, but I can't do anything without dedicated employees at every level. So let's talk about people and talent. You're in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You're headquartered here. You are uh, a large company with over 6,000 employees. People are your most important asset. Is this the best place for you to be? Is, is headquartering your, your corporation in, in Milwaukee, if, if talent is such an issue, why stay here? I'm glad you're asking on a 70 degree day in September. <laughs> um, well, I can dodge the question a little bit. The way to dodge that question is to say to remember, of the 6,000 people, not all of them are here. You know, they're, they're, all, they're spread out all over, really, essentially the, over the country, but really over the Midwest. Um, and so to some extent, uh, we, 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 we don't have, it's not as reliant as it sounds. But that being said, um, it's, it's Milwaukee, fortunately Milwaukee's a great place. There's an old saying I've, I've heard now a bunch of times in Milwaukee, it's really hard to get people to move here, it's even harder to get them to leave. <laughs> and so it's, uh, but that's, you know, it, oh, and listen, I, I think we all know, we have our challenges here that we have to address. We've got Achilles heels that I think need to be addressed that if we don't, we're gonna have an even bigger problem, but it's still a great city, and it's a great place to raise a family, and it's it, it attracts people of of it, but it, it can be tough to get people to, to come here, senior leadership people, you know, especially when they have opportunities other places. And some of our some of our businesses, it's 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 a little bit there's there's lots of opportunity everywhere. Some other there's if you want to be in the, if you want to be in the movie theater business, there's not a lot of places to go. Um, hotel business is different, you know. Um, but I, I, if you create a place, people with all the you know the summer here is spectacular. It's great values, but you have to sell it. It's not easy. But we we seem to attract very good people to be in our businesses. But it's much better today mainly because we're located in downtown Milwaukee. Our headquarters is in downtown Milwaukee. Uh, our prime, three of our prime hotels are in downtown Milwaukee, but our hotel management operation is in downtown Milwaukee. And the growth that we've been experiencing in the downtown, especially in the last decade, uh, has made it a very exciting place. Um, I used to live in the suburbs. I live downtown now, and it's very exciting. It's very energizing. And uh, I can only imagine what it is for young people who are really out there, you know, enjoying it all the time uh, when they're not working, right? <laughs> um, so, so it's gotten a little bit easier than it was. Now we still have, we still have lots of issues here. I don't have to tell you what uh, uh, what they are. We've seen plenty of evidence of it in the last couple of months. But then we have taxation and all of that that get to be drags on what we're 
trying to do because people come in and say, gee, <laughs> I didn't realize it was so expensive to live here. Real estate taxes are high. Uh, other state taxes are high. The one thing that's not high is sales tax. Comparatively, it's low here. But most people don't notice the sales tax, whether it's a penny more or less so much, because it's kind of every day, it's what, what do you call it, the Microsoft tax? Is that what you used to call it? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> Just a little nick at a time, you know, compared to the real estate tax bill that comes at the end of the uh, year or the rent bill that comes with the taxes loaded into it every month, um, that, that's a little more jarring. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we as a uh, broader uh, society in Wisconsin need to, and in Milwaukee need to be thinking about those issues and how it affects our ability to attract people and businesses here. And by virtue of that, uh, how do we think about all those issues as it relates to growth. So I, I want to make sure that I invite you all to ask questions if you have them. I've got plenty. <coughs> yes, sir. Um, question for you. Can you be a little more specific on some of the issues you guys see in Milwaukee and Wisconsin as far as growing the business and uh, um, what do you guys see? So I'm just going to repeat the question. Uh, can you be more specific around the issues related to growing a business in, in this region? I'm going to add to that. Uh, and the solutions for those things. Because we want to make sure that folks here hear the problem, but also hear how to solve it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's in charge. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> well, are, you, are you asking the question of, of, of the issues like we're, that we're talking about right now? We're saying here that we know we have challenges. Is that what you're you going to be more specific? OK, look. The other day, what about a month, maybe I'm losing trivia, six weeks ago, two, I eight weeks ago, we have an incident in the inner city. And I get a phone call. I'm getting texts and phone calls. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if other people in this room get this. Are you OK? Am I OK? Well, because Milwaukee is getting painted with a very broad brush, somewhat deservedly in some instances, but on a macro. But on a micro, of course, the, the, we, we all know it was five square blocks. And, and, but the national press gets a hold of it, and Milwaukee's on fire. And so in that, in that, in, in that small, in, small in scale incident, um, w if you want to attract people to come here, and they're worried about their safety, well, that's not going to be very conducive to growth of your business. And about. Cust you know, if you we I, we've talked about why do we why is why are we as a company philanthropic? We we've taken a very we've talked about a very community oriented stance. We volunteer. We we're part of things. Um, we 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 try to take care of the needs in our com in our community where, where people are in need. We also talk about the need to invest in our community assets. It can't just be one or all the other. You know, someone says, well, why would you build this beautiful anything? art museum, any uh, stadium, and yet we have people in need. Well, you've got to walk and chew gum at the same time. You've got to take care of people in need. You have to invest in your assets so that you are an attractive community for your associates who want to come in. We call them associates, employees who want to come and work for you, for people to live here, especially our businesses. We cannot, I've not figured how we could pick the Fister up and move it. It is impossible to move the Fister. It is impossible to move the, 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 the South Shore Theater. It ain't going here. We could move our headquarters, but we can't move our actual physical businesses. And if we don't have a, an, a community that is attractive, we are going to, um, we're, we are going to have, we will have trouble existing as a business. And so we have to address the issues that are, that are underlying. And what is the underlying issue? So, so, so Greg, I'm going to push you a little harder on this. What would you have the owners and of businesses and the supporters of businesses in this room, what would you have them do? Well, we have to take on what is going on. The disparity between our central city and, our, and, 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 the, and the community as a whole is, is too great. It's too great. And I, there's no, I don't think I can solve the problem sitting here in five minutes until you hear the easy things you can do. I mean, I can tell you, we have to somehow fix what is going on with education. And I'm not saying fix the education system. This is, 
It's, it's not just the, it's, you know, there's two sides to education. There's the supply side and the demand side. The, the supply side is the school. The demand side is the student population. And frankly, we have to invest in both. It's not just making sure we have good schools. It's we've got to have good schools, good teachers, and we have to have a student population that's able to, to learn in that, in that environment. We, we have to start to be able to figure out how to make investments. We did an, in, I, you know, so we have a real estate business. We also, we've, we have a non-public business where we own Verlo and, and a number of restaurants, Bomber, AJ Bombers and Sw Smoke Shack, and, and then we have uh, a, a real estate business. Part of the real estate business, we were looking at a concept that wanted to come to Milwaukee. And so we mapped out all the similar concepts as a restaurant concept. And they, you know, they, they were doing what we'd call a very top-down macroeconomic approach. Milwaukee has a population of you know, a million and a half people. It can take X number. And we said, well, let, me sh let, let us show you something. And you look, if you draw a box with Fond du Lac Avenue going up as a diagonal, and you probably go from, you know, from North Avenue to, uh, to, or maybe even a little bit farther south than North, but up to like, you know, Capitol Drive, maybe Silver Spring, and you and you and you'd sort of, and then you go out to about a hundred, hundred Highway 100, and you dry that box. There's no McDonald's in those box. In that box, you can't find a McDonald's. They're around the perimeter, but they're not in the box. Okay, something's wrong. That's a huge population that, for some reason, isn't being served. I don't know. I, I'm not gonna. I don't have to guess why, just know it is what it is. And if we don't fix that and start to address these issues, and you know, and we have to come up with new ideas. You know the definition of, I could tell you, I've been in so many meetings over all these years where people very, people who don't have an agenda other than to try and do the right thing are trying to be a part of the solution. And yet, I'm not seeing much change. Well, we have to figure out new ideas because the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. So we have to, and it's, it, it, is, it has to come from all sides. It has to come from within the inner city. It has to come from without. We have to, we have to, it has to come together as a community and start to, and, and develop some solutions. It has to happen. Or we're gonna, I think we're gonna have a problem if it doesn't. We already do have a problem. That's interesting. You talk about education as the first thing that came out of your mouth. That's kind of interesting. That that was the first. Well, look. You know, I grew up as a. I grew up in a family where, <laughs> and he knows because <laughs> his father said, you know, what what you know what are you going to study in school? What, what are you not? And what's your profession going to be? You know, education was of paramount importance in our family, and and you see that. Communities that have success, it starts, it starts with education. It starts there. It's not, it's not the only thing, but, it's, but it starts there. Now, that's not going to be fixed overnight. That's going to take generations to. Someone pointed out, it took 50 years for Milwaukee to get how it's become from what happened when we lost our manufacturing base and lots of manufacturing companies left. And then really, we had, we had started, the real problem started. And it, it's not going to be solved overnight. You want to know the sad thing is? The sad thing is that this discussion that we're just having now, I was a part of a similar discussion 45 years ago. It hasn't changed, and it isn't for lack of effort. It isn't for lack of resources being applied by the business community, by governmental bodies, and so it's very frustrating that we haven't figured it out. And I have to tell you, I'm very proud uh, of Greg on this one. You'll forgive me if I give you a little bit of, a, of, a, of an endorsement here, the editorial. Um, uh, Greg is now the chairman of the United Way board, okay? And he's also on the uh, Greater Milwaukee Foundation board. So the two organizations that are really up to their eyeballs in trying to deal with issues that relate to the whole community, but uh, in particular, the uh, what we would describe as the inner city, and uh, so there's it's all hands on deck, but it's been all hands on deck. Uh, it's just that we haven't been able somehow between the private sector and the governmental sector to figure out how to change the equation, and uh, it's been uh, as you pointed out, the, the central the downtown area. Somehow, all of a sudden, that thing has just come alive, like overnight almost. And, uh, but the inner city uh, continues to have uh, significant issues uh, going on. And education, I think, probably is a major factor.
So, so first of all, I, I, I agree with you, but I think that overnight took 45 mm -hmm. years that you've been working on it. Certainly, it's been anchor institutions. It's been, uh, it's been really important changes in infrastructure and so on. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why Scale at Milwaukee exists is to encourage uh, the growth in things like infrastructure and businesses that will demand things like employees and uh, manufacturing bases and so on. So we're going to wrap up, uh, but I would love to give you all you know, 30 seconds apiece. You've got an audience of business owners, of people who support businesses, of lawyers, accountants, private citizens, employees. You get one thing to say to them about how uh, they can be an impactful growth agent. What is that one thing you say? Oh, Lord. <laughs> keep, keep doing it. <laughs> and whatever you can, however you can figure out to multiply and replicate yourselves, uh, as we do with our businesses, trying to replicate our businesses, um, can make all the difference in the world. Uh, it's, it's, it's so exciting to see young people wanting to be a part of what's going on in Milwaukee, and not only that, take advantage of what's going on because if you're in an area that's got growth going on and excitement going on and energy going on, it can only be helpful to you as you look for customers and as you look for other people to work in your businesses. So. Nice. Good time. Greg, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I'll, I just I'll echo what you said. I, I, I yeah, it, it is what you're doing is really really important because education, as we started with, is the foundation for then being successful in being able to be contribute to contribute to uh, to organizations that are going to make our our economy strong because it comes down to jobs in the end, right? It's about work and it's about creating economic opportunity, and that's what everybody in this room is doing. So surround yourself with really good people, the best people you can find, because that will make you better and keep at it and persevere and there will be good days and bad days amen to that so uh first let's let's uh, show them our appreciation thank you all so much for being here today there's just a, a couple of announcements then we'll let you go first on your chairs there's an evaluation Please complete the evaluation. You'll notice at the bottom, there's two questions that we ask at every event that Scale Up Milwaukee does. One of the things we're trying to understand is the degree to which we are changing as a region to become more growth-oriented, more ambitious, and more capable of achieving this ambitious growth. Second, Scale Up Milwaukee has a membership platform, which we would love to talk to you about. Uh, we have several members in the room. and. I would invite you to talk to them about it as well. Uh, I would love for our membership manager to sort of raise her hand. If you have questions about Skeleton Milwaukee as a membership platform, please connect with Heather. Our membership is about making this conversation uh, constant and a, and a tangible aspect of our work. Finally, we are having a meeting on October 6th. We would love to see you there. If you have questions about Skeleton Milwaukee or if you would like to continue talking with the Marcuses, uh, you should do that after we conclude. Thank you again, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Thank very you much. so you much. Were, that was great. You were terrific. You were very good. You guys made it easy. <laughs> you guys made it easy. I love it. it. You know, it's an interesting thing to uh, sort of read as much as you can about someone before you talk to them. And we usually only read as much as we can about people who are long gone who will never meet. But to kind of know more about you than you can even imagine <laughs> and then talk to you, it's just really fantastic. So I appreciate it. You know, one of the things I was, I, I, you didn't get around to talk the economic stuff. My big concern right now is I now have a viable second generation behind me. And as you're looking upward, could you guys both look up, you, you're, you're the viable second generation, you're the viable third generation. How did you know? When did you know? What did you do? You talked about 28, 26 and everything, but did you know then and at what point, was, where was the turning? What was the magic moment that you knew that now is my turn or now I'm coming up? 
<laughs> I remember that thinking that actually. I was like, but I, but I, look, I, wouldn't, I knew there was an opportunity. I didn't know that it, there was never. A, hey, you're going to be in charge one day. You were but never I, just anointed. Never anointed. <laughs> okay. But I figured I had a. If I had to pick where I had the best chance of leading something and being a part of something, well, I got a better chance where I show up and I don't for a long time. <laughs> and okay. so I said, you know, the, and, and we were in fun businesses. So it was very attractive to come back and say, oh, this is the work. Restaurants and movie theaters and hotels. This is a fun business. I can be a part of something fun. Oh, and so yeah. and if I could get a chance to lead it one day, well, that would be cool. But we had a lot of very capable people around. And so who knew what? I didn't know for sure what happened. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it, 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 kind of moving out. And we have a sport of yes. We're yeah. here at Soccer Park. Right. 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 Uh, we have private things which also we think about my obligation to think about the company. You know, corporations have only their life. Right. But as dad, you always probably knew your son would come up. But when does the son know that that that's where I that's Well, I think that's true of the general thing that goes on over a little bit of time. Tim and I are sort of assuming more leadership. So sure. Sure. And if, if, if he wants to, to, at some point, he would have said, stop. I, I didn't want to do this. Is there a fourth? Fourth generation? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're yeah. in college, so we don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> not not, not, not defined yet. Yeah. Because um, I, it would not be this Sunday. It's, it's a little bit of an inner process that goes on between one generation and the other. Yeah. Are you, you're, you're just going to kind of be watchful and talkative and um, ask if there's yeah, interest, yeah, right? I mean, it's, the interest has to come from the next generation. And yeah, yeah, actually, the, uh, the discussion I had with one of the children, I said to him, because this child uh, said, here's what I want to do. I'm thinking that I want to do this, and I would have done it. This is my, these are my things. Yeah, look at four of them. Yeah. That's it. And, 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 and this kid never said I, I, I want to come back to work in the business. I just look at it. Whatever. 